Okay, well, we're back with the 20 and 20 podcast. We're joined by our next guest. He's Dr. Ronald Jayner. How you doing, Doc? I'm doing great. Very happy to be here. Also, we have on, our, on the line our administrator, uh, Simon Wilcox. So he's going to be, be able to interject and uh, ask questions also. And, uh, of course, the star of our show, Mr. Kermit Washington. Well, you know what? Uh, this show, I'm going to learn a lot, so I'll be a little bit quieter this time, <laughs> finding out something I don't know about. Usually we have um, athletes or sports figures, or we had a hypnotist. We've had so many different people, but it's very interesting to learn. And so on our podcast, we want to have a variety of people, different subjects. So when people look up and down at our index, they can say, oh, I don't want to see this one. I want to listen to this one. Uh, when they're driving or when they're home, we want to have we want to have their attention. Very good, excellent. So you're working with uh, uh, Vitality and Integrative Health. Yes, and uh, I've I've got over forty years of experience in working with people with chronic health challenges okay. and life challenges. So, as I was telling one of the gentlemen earlier. Modern medicine in the last 100, 150 years has dramatically shifted to acute care crisis management. And so 100, 150 years ago, 85% of the population roughly was dying of acute infection, typhoid, yellow fever, cholera, and, uh, and acute uh, trauma. They'd be, you know, there was no way to control extensive bleeding, uh, no way to, to handle deep surgical trauma or reconstructive surgery, anything like that. So... There were basically three advancements in medicine that changed everything. A couple of them we don't want you to know about. <laughs> well, a couple of them are okay. One's anesthesia. Mm-hmm. When they developed anesthesia, now they could do complex surgeries. Instead of prior to that, surgeons were measured not by how good they were, but by how fast they were. They'd literally use stopwatches in the ER to see how fast, they, because otherwise patients bled out no matter how good a surgeon they were. So when they got anesthesia, they were able to slow down and do a much better job. The next was antibiotics, because now they could control infection and uh, much better. The third one's the one we don't want you to know about, because it has two parts to it. Um, The first one, you're not going to tell anybody, are you? (laughs) First one was getting doctors to wash their hands. Mm, I know. Because they would go from doing an autopsy on a putrid corpse and go in and deliver a baby. Mm. You know, and and the infant mortality was just off the charts. Unfortunately, the do- first doctor who discovered this and started to promote it was vilified and stripped of his profession. That was how much uh, you know, anger there was over implying that doctors weren't clean. But uh, that was a biggie. And the second one that went along with it was public sanitation, and um, particularly with the sewage and, and the water supplies, because they were losing a third to half of the babies to cholera and typhoid, and they, do- they tracked that back to the water supply. And fortunately, there were some brilliant doctors. A couple of them were actually women. The, the, the person in New York was, was a woman. And they, again, they tried to strip her of her medical license because she started, got the authority from the city to start cleaning up the water supply, separating sewage from, from water. And believe it or not, the Brooklyn Pediatric Association <laughs> uh, sued her for destroying their profession because they weren't getting enough sick kids coming in anymore. Mm. <laughs> so anyway, that's, those, are the, those are the big three. Now, once we got those going, there's obviously other things, but those three were the cornerstone of, cr- of creating what we now have as one of the best medical systems in the world or in the history of mankind. If you're in a car accident, I'm not going to an acupuncturist. I'm not coming to an herbalist or a nutritionist. I'm going to a trauma center, and they're amazing. They do great work. Now, at the same time, the demographics totally changed. Now, if you look at the, the statistics on people who die, roughly 50% die of cardiovascular disease, heart attacks and strokes. Uh, officially, about a third die of cancer, immune deficiency diseases, and viral diseases. And then you've got a smattering of liver cirrhosis and, and uh, uh, lung diseases and so forth. So basically, the chronic diseases have taken over. Now, what's interesting about those is that we're still trying to treat them as if they were an acute infection. So we're waiting, for example, heart disease is a great example. Um, For the most part, we wait until you've had your first heart attack to diagnose heart disease. Well, 50% of initial heart attacks are fatal. 
So we're waiting to see if you survive the initial heart attack lottery. And if you do, now we'll treat you for heart disease. And mm. we have wonderful crisis management. We have angiograms and heart transplants and strong drugs to manipulate the heart chemistry and so forth. But if you look at a 10-year retrospective on those techniques, the survival rate and the, the efficacy versus placebo <laughs> is about 4 or 5%. It's not really working that well. Now, the other part is, how long do you have heart disease before you get a heart attack? Mm. Okay? The fact is, it's usually 10, 20, 30 years. Why aren't we doing something during that period? Because there's no expensive <laughs> intervention or crisis management that's going to work. Now we're talking about a totally different system of medicine that would prevent the heart disease from getting any worse than it is already. Mm. Okay? Same with cancer. A lot of people don't know this. By the time... A woman can palpate a lump the size of a pea in her breast. She's, uh, she, this is conventional oncology. She's probably had cancer for 8 to 15 years, but it was not diagnosable because there was no lump to biopsy. Oh, I see. You see. Uh, same with other cancers. Certain cancers like colon cancer can be 10, 20 years, 30 years even, before it gets bad enough to where it creates a severe symptom. Now we can come in with expensive crisis management, and that's what our system is built on because big corporations and insurance companies have taken over medicine. Mm. See? Mm. Now, in the process of going from acute care to this chronic issue, the acute care model replaced the constitutional medical models of traditional medicine. Mm. In Germany and Europe, we had a thousand-year history of naturopathic medicine, which is I'm a naturopath, by the way, uh, using herbs and... Uh, uh, physical therapy and emotional work to help people with chronic health conditions. And that all kind of got pushed to the side when patent method medicines came along and could do a better job on acute care. Uh, in China, like I have a diplomat in oriental medicine. In China, they had the same constitutional system, not the same, but the same type of system for over 3,000 years. And people were living much longer than they live now, believe it or not. If you didn't die in childhood or from trauma, you were just as likely to live to be 70 or 80. Now, we say people in ancient times lived 30, 40, mm -hmm. okay? That was mostly in Europe, living in those cities where the, where the uh, sewage was dumped into the water supply. Right, right. Okay? Or, or on the street. <laughs> or on the street, which again <laughs> flowed into the river where they got their drinking water. Yeah. And then we wonder why so many people were dying young. But even then, there were people living into their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And the general rule was if you lived to be five, you would live to be 80 hmm. because you had survived all these infections and your immune system had been, been yeah. naturally vaccinated. Okay. So there, was, there were a significant number of people still living to an older age. So anyway, um, I got involved in this. I was, my dad was 40 years old. And um, he developed, he had had prostate, a cancer, uh, surgery for prostate cancer a couple years before, but seemed to be okay. He fell off a ladder. He was a painter and severe back pain. I took him to the hospital. They put him in traction for 11 days. He just got worse and Oof. worse and worse. And finally, somebody thought to do a myelogram, check his, check the spinal fluid. Lit up like a Christmas tea. He had bone cancer from head to toe. Oh, no. Mm. So you can imagine what's, what um, <laughs> traction did to that. Oh, my God. And interestingly, when we bet, went back to get the medical records, they, were th they couldn't find them. They didn't know what had happened in that case, but <laughs> we could never oh, get wow. the documentation. But anyway, um, it was really bad. And so at 40 years old, he was told he had three to six weeks to live. They gave him a prescription for unlimited morphine. And sent him home. He said, well, what am I, doctor, what am I supposed to do about this? He says, Mr. Janer, you're going to die in about three, four weeks. Say goodbye to everybody. Get your affairs and orders and say goodbye. When we got dad home, and he was not only a painter, he was a lay minister, and he said, I ain't going to die no dang drug addict. you got to find something else. Well, we were living in rural South Dakota. There was no <laughs> internet. The nearest health food store was 400 miles away. But somebody had told us about a, a doctor in Rochester, Minnesota, who knew how to treat things differently. And we went and saw him, and uh, he got my dad on some, a different kind of diet. He talked to him about stress, and he gave him some things that would help with the pain that were not narcotics. Okay? Mm. And my dad died three years ago in Santa Barbara, California, cancer-free for over 40 years. Wow. 
That's awesome. Yeah. So you're you're saying that the mind is so powerful and belief that he's going to succeed in um, conquering this, that's that's almost like um, placebo or pl- a plus. Exactly. Exactly. What we call spontaneous remission. Now, in his case, it was a combination of factors because you also there's basically four reasons why people get sick. I've got a little video on YouTube about it. But there's four basic reasons why we develop any type of health problem. One is uh, toxicity, like uh, like my dad and I did, which I'll explain in a second. Physical trauma, especially concussions, can cause long term health problems and nutritional deficiencies. Now, what's interesting about those three is that if you have an acute condition, something has been in your body less than three months, that's where the cutoff is, you can usually, in over 90% of cases, a doctor can fix that with those three things. I don't care what kind of doctor you are. We do physical therapy. We do some kind of nutrition. We have you get some rest. Let's say you break your leg. All right? You You get it set, cast. You rest for six, eight weeks. It's better than it was before it was broken. All right? Right. But when you go past the 90 days, everything changes. The neurophysiology actually changes, and doctors aren't taught this. It's in the medical literature, but I actually do lectures in post-grad medical schools explaining this to doctors. So the information is there, but they don't put it together because the medical system is based on crisis management, right? The fourth factor is often said to be stress, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Because we've all known... Very, very high stress people who are healthy and function at a very high level. That's true, yeah. As athletes, a lot of stress, and yet you could also be very healthy. You're functioning at a very high level, right? So, what's the difference? Well, we discovered the difference was how you instinctively react to stress, and most of that is programmed before you're five years old by your family. Genetics? No. Okay. Just a learned way, behavior when you're that young? It's a learned behavior b- from being a child. Oh, I see. In animals, genetics determines most of their instinct. There's animals that never meet their parents, like sea turtles, and yet they end up, they go out to sea and come back to that same beach and nobody tells them how to do it, right? Humans, we have a little bit of that instinct. Uh, for example, fight or flight is a genetic instinct. That's why they slap you on the rump when you're born because you gasp and, and, and go into a shock reaction and you start breathing. Right, you get fight or flight. You got to move, um, but most we figure eighty eighty five percent of what we have as instinct as humans is actually learned behavior that we get by recording the emotions and behaviors of the people around us our first five six years of life. We've actually done brainwave studies the last few years and shown that children under the age of six, maybe seven are living in a learning trance. If you, if you, they're literally sleepwalking, and all they're doing is recording everything going on around them. And I know mothers argue with, about, with me about that all the time. But the fact is, do, ch- do the kids listen to what you say, or do they copy what you do? You say. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So if you grew up in a family of screamers, guess what you're going to do? You see, if, right. if, if they threw and things, you're going to throw things. If they were calm and relaxed, you're going to do the same way. Now, this doesn't show up in everyday life. It shows up when you're stressed, okay? Your back's against the wall. Like one of my teachers used to say, if you squeeze a lemon, what are you going to get? Lemon juice. Lemon right. juice. What do you get if you squeeze an apple? Apple juice. What do you do if you squeeze a human? You get a two- or three-year-old throwing a temper tantrum. Because any of us, when we're under a certain level of stress, our cognitive thinking turns off, okay? Yeah. And this part of the autoreactor system that keeps us alive runs the programs that kept us alive when we were a child or that our parents were using when they were stressed out. And so, sad fact, 90, roughly 90, 95% of the Earth's population is going to die who they were emotionally and socially under stress as when they were two, three, four years old. Mm. Now that can be changed. That's part of the work that that we do, but it's, it has to be, there's a specialized form of therapy. And and the challenge is we've had a hundred years of trying to do talk therapy and athletics, positive thinking, affirmations, all of that. It doesn't work. Very inefficient. Why? Same reason children don't listen to you. 
these programs are in a part of the brain, the midbrain cerebellum area, that does not have a direct connection to the neocortex mm. and therefore does not understand words. Mm. Ron, we have a question here. This, this is Dr. Wilcox, the Administrator for Vitality Health. Um, apparently someone called in, and I guess they know your father's history. Yeah. Because they asked you to tell the story about the toxins your father had. Right. And the second question is if you could address what vitality does for CTE, for for brain trauma. Okay. All right. So um, with my dad, the rest of the story was we w- I w- at the same time he was told he was going to die, I was told that I was probably going to die too. Only I was I was deteriorating, but they said at the r- they didn't know why, but the rate I was deteriorating, <coughs> it would be three to four years I'd be gone. I was 19 years old. What were the symptoms that you had? I had severe tachycardia, uh, uh, hallucinations, um, I had a lot of um, motor difficulties, and I couldn't think clearly. Um, basically, my le- neurological system was shutting down. So I'd ask the doctors, I said, do you think the work my dad and I do has anything to do with this? Well, we were industrial spray painters. No. Oh. We were working with a dozen of the most toxic solvents known to mankind, most of which are illegal to use now. You know the airplane glue yeah. that uh, kids sniff and it can kill them in one hit? I used to stand over 50-gallon vats of that, d- dipping wet, uh, wooden pallets into it for days at a time. Okay, Jeez. So the exposure levels my dad and I had far above anything they can even conceive today. And, um, and then on top of that, my dad being kind of anal, <laughs> he, uh, he believed that you should keep your tools clean. Okay, Old school. Well, most painters will throw their brush or spray gun into a bucket, a solvent, and leave it overnight, come back, shake it out, and use it. No. We worked an hour every night in five-gallon buckets of solvent cleaning our tools and everybody else's on the crews. And oh, I did geez. that for years. So you just and it just it wicked into the body. So this, it's all gone in a few breaths of fresh air. I can get in a sauna right now, and part of why I'm a little heavy, and, or I can lose 20 pounds in a month. You can smell solvents oozing out of my tissue. You're 50 years later. Saturated with it. Just saturated. It stays that long. It does. And the doctors that have <coughs> tested me, they have no way of explaining why I'm even here or why I function as well as I do. And I still have health issues because of it. Mm-hmm. But I've learned it's that part you talked about. You learn how to mentally manipulate those emotional circuits and energy circuits, and they have a direct pathway into how the body functions. Mm. That's an important part of the work we're doing. Because what we discovered is that your mind doesn't control your body. Mm, that's something new to me. Yeah, because we're all told, we ask everybody, well, what do you think, Kermit? But thinking has nothing to do with this for the most part. There's only one thing your mind can do that's useful at all in body function, and that's make a cho- choice to kick your butt out of bed in the morning and go work out. That's it. But once you start working out, once you start changing things, the only thing that matters is how you feel about what you're doing. So when an athlete goes into competition and you uh, psych yourself up, we think that's a mental thing. But is it, or are you changing the way you feel about what you're going to do? It's the feelings that control everything from the neck down. We now know that the cognitive mind, for example, our thinking mind, processes information about one to 2,000 bits a second. Your body is processing hundreds of billions of bits of information a second, but you can't track that with your mind, you see. Right. Yeah. But it, the only reason it works is because the part that's a computer, we say the mind's a computer. No, the mind is the person sitting at the computer choosing what program to run, okay? The body is a computer that runs memorized programs, 85% of them learned before you were five years old or where you were born with, and then which program runs when is determined by how you feel. So like none of us probably writes programming language or reads or writes it or what code, all right? Right. So how do we make these computers work? Well, we click on icons and maybe type in a little information (laughs) and and go from there, right? Well, the, sa- the body works the same way. Only what we discovered in just the last 20 years is that the icons that run the body computer are your feelings. And when you focus, you choose to focus, and it creates a feeling, your body will try to match that feeling. So this is the mechanism you spoke of earlier, Kermit. If people that are happy 
don't tend to get as sick because they're constantly showing their body with a feeling, this is what I want you to do. And the body will literally try to, to match that program to any other time in your life when you felt good, and it'll run the programs. Now, the, the other part that was only discovered in the last 10 years or so, we know that works neurophysiologically, we know it works metabolically, but guess what? Your DNA is the same way. There's a whole new science called epigenetics. We now know that you can, you can adjust about 95% of your DNA, your genes, with the same thing. Your environment, the food you eat, the attitudes you have, primarily your emotions, and you literally change things. Mm. So they, they, it's interesting how they discovered this. The body uses about 100,000 proteins. That's what everything's made out of, yeah. for the most part. And there's another 40,000 um, proteins that are used to manipulate and combine these other proteins when they make tissue. Okay? So we expected when we did the genetic research, you heard about the genome thing. With yeah. The, yeah, okay. They expected to find 140,000 genes. Each gene produced a specific protein. Hmm. Okay? They only found about 27,000. Okay. So passion. how do we get all the 140? Every one of those genes is capable of making anywhere from 150 to 3,000 different proteins, depending on how they're configured. Mm. What determines how they're configured? Your emotional attitude, <laughs> your behavior, your diet. Oh, wow. And so you literally control it. And, the, and the, the, the biggest part of it that we work with the most, you, have, you literally are walking around in two different bodies. Okay? It's the same structure, same nutrients, same chemicals, but your body is either organized in such a way that is using your energy and metabolism to get stuff done. That's how you react to stress. Think, it's called sympathetic arousal, and think sympathy. You're reacting to something outside of you, whether that's in sports or yeah. whether that's your relationship or whatever, but you're reacting to outside. So your body programs all of its energy to handle that. The most extreme example being fight or flight. You got a grizzly bear chasing you, and your body isn't worried about uh, digesting breakfast. It'll puke it out so you can run faster, right? right. <laughs> so that's the sympathetic. The other is parasympathetic. Think of parachutes slowing everything down. That's when the body uses those exact same nutrients, those exact same resources to heal itself. Okay? Now, in today's world, how many people are li living a relatively stress-free life? Oh, I'd say 80%. <laughs> Stress-free? Stress no, no, it's a stressful. Uh, that's stressful, oh, yeah. and it actually Very is probably more. So if, you, so if you give me a moment, I'm going to tell you the three things doctors don't know about this. And again, it's in the literature. There's been research on it, but we're not taught this in medical school. But it's what we base our therapy system on at Vitality Brain Systems and Integrative Healthcare. Number one, everyone pretty much knows what happens to your body in fight or flight. You, uh, all your energy goes into running or fighting. Uh, there's no energy put into tissue repair. Your immune system shuts down. In fact, the macrophages that actually destroy cancer cells are deactivated by adrenaline and cortisol. So you can't, even, you can't fight cancer. Um, your, your tissue repair, no. If you have a sprained ankle, do you notice it? Do you ever play a game with a sprained ankle? Yes. And when you were in the middle of competition, were you thinking about the sprained ankle? No. It was all gone, right? Not all gone, but you could keep going. Pretty much you <laughs> could keep going. Well, that's, these are all, and when, if they ever shot you up with cortisone, that's a normal natural hormone the body produces when you're running from a bear so that you can run with a sprained ankle. You see? Yeah. All right. So here's number one. How long does that last? You're in a game. You're chased by a bear, right. game's over, you're home after the, right. somebody killed the bear. How long before your body resets itself from sympathetic arousal back to parasympathetic so it can start healing? And I asked doctors this. What do you guys think? How long does it take? Now, I would say as soon as you calm and cool down. Yeah, just yeah. see, yeah. you guys should go to medical school because that's what doctors say. Uh, one or two hours, a couple days, right? No, not a couple of days, but I'd say hours. Yeah. You know what the real answer is? What? Two to ten years. Wow. It takes that long to reset everything. It takes that everything, long right? to reset unless you get specialized care like we give people. Oh, I see. Mm. That's incredible. It is. Now, why do they say a couple hours? As an athlete, I can understand it. Mm -hmm. 
doctors, most of modern medicine is based on two things, autopsies and animal studies. If a gazelle's chased by a lion, gets away, what are they doing 10 minutes later? They're eating. They forgot all about it. <laughs> they were, yeah, back now, are you a gazelle with no creative imagination or memory system? No. No, we relive it over and over in our mind and in really in our hearts, and we feel it. Let me give you a really extreme example, but it's the best one I know, even though it's very sad. If a woman is assaulted and she's all by herself, She's got to call out to a passerby, tell them what happened. They call the police. Now she's got to tell the police. Then the paramedics come. She's got to tell them what happened. Then she gets to the hospital. She's got to tell the nurses. They do a rape kit. Now they've got to tell the doctor. Now she's got to talk to the detectives. Now she's got to tell her family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Heaven forbid she has to go to court and retell this over and over. How many yeah. times has she been raped? Every single time she retold it. Because no. anything you re-experience with the emotional content, your body thinks it's still happening. And that's what creates PTSD. And very few people know that. But it's that repetitious memory me movies. I mean, you know the research about doing practicing free throws in your head? And if you were just blah, 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 nothing happens. But if you focus as if you were really shooting a free throw, feel it as you practice you'll get the exact same benefit as you were out on the court practice. Yeah, psychosymanetics. Psychosymanetics. Cybernetics, that. yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. And that's what I'm talking about. But the secret that we overlooked was you have to do it with the feeling of it, okay? Now, why aren't we more aware of this? Well, the second thing is we've all had the experience of going to a new job or a new place, and we got to pay attention or we get lost. But if you go to the same place every day for three, four weeks, what happens? You can be driving there, talking on the phone, listening to the radio, daydreaming, and you get there and you don't remember driving. Now think about that. Driving in traffic, adjusting for pedestrians and, and stoplights and all that, you don't remember it? That's how powerful these memory patterns are. Yeah. Once you've relived this internal trauma for a few weeks, your body memorizes it in the subconscious. And that's why we're not, that's why we, on a day-to-day -day basis, we may not remember or think about it unless some kind of a movie or a feeling or somebody says something a certain way and it triggers the memory. Have you ever had someone say something to you and it got you upset and you totally overreacted to what they said? Yeah. Why did you do that? Because it, it triggered an emotional memory in your subconscious of all the other times somebody said something like that. And maybe as a kid, they were really mean about it. And now all that piles out and comes out in, in mm. present times called the blue lens effect. So that's the second thing is this all goes non-cognitive, and so we're not really aware of it. But remember I said two to ten years. Mm. Now, for everybody listening and everybody here, how many of us have gone two years and we only had one stressful event in two years? Oh, nobody. No. Nobody. No. So now tell me how many people are stressed because these things compound in your subconscious. And those fight-or-flight phenomena, the down-regulation of digestion, the down-regulation of healing, the down-regulation of awareness of pain, continues and builds. That's why heart disease, cancer, diabetes are called symptomless diseases. You will not know you have them until the stress, internal stress of the disease exceeds the daily stress of your life and all this memorized stress. So until the threat of dying of cancer is greater than the threat of, if I don't get this done, my boss is going to kill me. If I don't jump higher, run faster, the coach is going to kill me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so we literally even talk that way, that it's a life and death thing to get this stuff. If I don't get, get more money this week, I can't pay the rent. My kids are going to be out in the street, you see? Yeah. And what makes it worse is it's not something fight or flight can fix. You're laying in bed worrying at 3 o'clock in the morning about bills or about a relationship. What exactly are you supposed to do about it at 3 o'clock in the morning? What's your body supposed to do about it? It can't. And yet every time we trigger anxiety or worry, we're triggering fight or flight hormones, and they only have one purpose, a genetic purpose. Fight or flight is to escape from grizzly bears, period, or to perform at a high level in athletics. But even then, if you can stay calm and hit that zone place, you can perform better than you can with fight or flight, right? Yeah. You see? So now those are, those are the things that are really those first two. Now the third one, it actually gets worse because when you compound all that stress 
and then you add more stress, at some point, the body begins to hardwire these stress patterns into the midbrain cerebellum as if they are what's keeping you alive. You're running from the bear. If I keep mm. running, I stay alive. Okay? I've had cancer for 10 years. I've had a lot of stress. If I keep the cancer, I'll stay alive. Mm. And this is where addiction lives. I, I, was, I was shocked. 15 years ago, I went to a lecture. Um, it was actually a regular therapy for addiction. And the guy explained the neurophysiology of addiction, which is well understood. Don't know how to treat it, but they're good at it. They know how it works. Um, it was the exact same neurophysiology my partner and I developed over 40 years ago to treat terminal cancer patients. People become addicted to these long-term diseases, which is why you can get them into remission, but you can't keep them there. Okay? I see. So what we have created with Vitality Health Systems is we're looking at, you're still going to have the three original factors. You're going to have physical trauma, especially post-concussive trauma and TBIs and things like that. You're going to have uh, toxicity. You're going to have deficiencies because people don't eat that good, all right? But what regulates whether or not those things are used for healing is whether or not you can repair how they handle stress instinctively. And so we put the two together. And we had, we've got, between the two of us, essentially a century of experience in how to rehabilitate chronic health issues but also all of the latest neuroscience and, and information on neuroplasticity, placebo effect, and uh, spontaneous remission, mm. which is all of the factors your own body can bring to bear emotionally to maximize your healing benefit. So, so Ron, is Vitality just using talk therapy? Or they, well, no, we don't use any talk therapy. Okay, so talk therapy doesn't work. Hmm. So what, what are we using then? Uh, baseball bats. <laughs> 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 Believe it or not, that has been tried. Uh, <laughs> there are certain forms of ex aggressive therapy where they are very aggressive with people because to, to get them to shift out of these patterns. I don't agree with that. Right? No, what you have to do is instead of focusing on thinking, how many times a day is somebody asks, what do you think? I never ask anybody, what do you think? No. Because I don't care. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but I will ask over and over and over, how are you feeling right now, Kermit? How do you feel? I feel good. Would you like to feel better? Yes, all the reasons. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Pause. Focus on the happiest day of your life, maybe holding a baby, playing with, you know, the best play you ever made in basketball. What did that feel like? Okay. That's take, cool. wonderful. Take a deep breath and exhale with that feeling. And then say, thank you. Thank you for that awesome feeling. Thank you, God. Right? <laughs> now, how do you feel? Well, I feel good. I feel good. Take a deep, I, breath. I smile. Take a deep breath. Focus on that, that peak experience again. Exhale slowly. Thank you for that. Is How it do the, you feel? Is it the, the, the steak in college at the recruitment dinner? You know, first of all, <laughs> let me tell you what I'm thinking about. I, you think about, the, you know, when I played, when the greatest game I played. Yeah. But it, it be, that's what gets people through a lot of things is the good memories. That's right. Um, <clears throat> well, I remember reading a book. The body doesn't know the difference between a real and an unreal situation. As long as there's a feeling, you're absolutely yes. right. And so when I, when I have the good memories, which I have a lot of good memories, you know, it can help me in a situation when maybe I'm not feeling great because I have good memories. And a lot That's of people right. might not have good memories or successful memories overcoming certain things. And I, I think it could compound them not to get better. It could right. get worse. Exactly. And because so many of our stresses in modern day life, our, our, mental, our mental, social, financial relationship, those are not things you can beat up or run away from. If you have a young mother, uh, single mom, three kids, just lost her job, doesn't know how to pay the rent, is telling her to just do positive thinking going to do much? No. 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 And if she's laying in bed at night worrying about it, does that do much? Does going and beating up the boss fix it? Does running away from the kids fix it? See, there's nothing fight or flight can do that helps. So you're absolutely right. You have stumbled on the core of how we help these people because everybody has a positive experience somewhere or they can imagine one. Even I have a client right now. It's got deep depression, but they like petting a kitty. So we use that over and over. Okay, so now take a breath. Pause, exhale slowly, pet your kitty, and say thank you. Thank you for the kitty. 
And the thing is, like you said, you're absolutely right. The body can't tell the difference. And so, and there's actually a scripture in the Bible I based this on when I developed it. It's Philippians 4, 6. But Philippians 4, 4 to 9 is a nine-step process for dissolving anxiety, okay? But the core of it is verses uh, 6 and 7, where it says, give your anxiety to God. So number one, you don't deny that you're upset. There are therapy systems, talk systems that tell you don't talk about it. Just don't think about it, right? That's crazy. It doesn't work. No, it doesn't. You're lying to yourself, okay? Nothing gets better with lies, all right? So give your, give your supplication to God. Let him know what you're upset about. And then it says, with thanksgiving. Give the, give the concern <coughs> and then say thank you for something you care about. Mm. And it says, do that over and over. And the peace of God descends upon you and calms your heart and your mind. Do you want a water? Yes, please. All right. Yeah, I grab one. So the question is, is there, are there any herbals or vitamins or IVs that we use <coughs> along with this treatment? Of course. You have to do multifactorial, um, individualized, multiple modality therapies. Because once someone has had a condition for 10, 20, 30 years, especially if it's stress-based, and most of them are, then there's not going to be one thing wrong. Mm. There's going to be whole systems of the body that are shutting down yeah. or overworked or exhausted. So we come at all four factors. We do work on the physical trauma uh, and rehabilitating that. We do work with highly evolved nutrition. I've been a clinical nutritionist for almost 50 years now. And there are things we know in nutrition that will help with provide the raw materials, okay? And then detoxifying, because like my dad and I, full of those chemicals, you're not going to get us well until you get rid of some of those chemicals. So. But what ties it all together is the emotional work. And I was so happy to meet with Dr. Wilcox because he actually has a nutritional program and an IV program that directly feeds the brain so that the brain can rehabilitate itself. Oh, and so you put the, all of those things together because there's no one thing. Uh, if you... If people ask me all the time, well, what did you do with your dad to get him well? Well, I can talk for hours about the different therapies we used on my dad. Right. However, to Kermit's point, if you ask my dad what happened, he'll point to a time four or five years into this process, and he'd say, I was laying in bed in a lot of pain, spring of the year in South Dakota. I looked out the window. It's a beautiful day. And I wanted to cry because I hurt so much. And I just decided in my heart, from this day on, I'm not letting anyone on earth, including Tony Janer, is his name, Satan the devil, my family, nobody's going to rob me from my divine birthright to be happy. And from that day on, he actually was also where I got this from. He developed his uh, lem uh, lemons to lemonade system. And I don't care what you said to that man, he'd flip it around and, and give you, feed you something good back. Mm. And he did that for the, the other 40 years of his life. I got to tell you one that <laughs> got me. So I turned 50, 55, somewhere in there. And I'm feeling down, you know, like there were things I wished I could have done, things I wished I could have done better. And I'm talking to my dad and I said, Dad, I'm just pretty discouraged. I just feel like I haven't accomplished what I wanted to accomplish in life. And, and my dear father says, yeah, Ron, I've known you all your life. You've done some incredibly stupid things. But he said, you know, Ron, I've never known you once to come to me or your mom and say, Dad, I know what I'm going to do now. And if I do it, I'm going to make me and everybody else around me miserable. There's three aspects to the human experience. There's the mind, there's the body, and there's your spirit, your relationship with God. Okay? Mm -hmm. I see my work and the work we do together as integrating those three so that they're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. all right? Now, your mind and your spirit are universal. You can imagine, you can think about the past, the future, uh, the present. You can make stuff up, right? Yeah. And God, of course, is aware of everything. And when we tap into the Spirit, as it says in First Corinthians two, we become aware of everything. Hmm. A spiritual man examines all things, but body's different. Could you give me thirty push-ups, two o'clock yesterday, right now? Could I? Yeah, right now. Give me I, a couple push-ups right now. I don't feel like it, but I could. <laughs> at three, at three o'clock yesterday. Oh no, 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 there's no way. Well, no. how about if you could uh, do a couple of pull-ups at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon, right now? 
No, you can't do no. that. <laughs> you can't do that. See, right. the body is different from the mind and spirit because it's God's gift to us to interface with physical reality, and it only does it one moment at a time. Yeah. So I'll give you one of the big secrets of how Dr. Wilcox and I help people. What are you feeling? Not what you're thinking, because the thinking can go anywhere, right? What do you feel right now? Okay, that's your body. We now know that feelings in the body are the same thing. It's your subconscious body talking to you when you have a feeling. So what are you feeling? What do you feel, Kermit? I feel good. I, I feel good. I'm listening to good. you guys. I'm now learning. Does, does that fit the circumstance where you're at right now, physically where you're at? Is that an appropriate oh, yes, feeling? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. But now let's say that you were worried about bills, and you're sitting there in the back of your head, oh, my God, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I right. going to pay the bills? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Does that fit this moment? No. No. Not so you're all. And you're creating an emotion, which is the icon to body function. You're telling your body there's a bear coming and we got to run, but you got to sit there. I see. We're sitting in an office and the boss is screaming at us and our body's saying, I got to run, I got to beat this guy up. We're not allowed to do that. And it creates incredible levels of tension and stress. Mm -hmm. And those kinds of stresses don't resolve. They stay in the body, especially if they happen over and over, and they, they perpetuate and they turn off the body's ability to heal itself. You know, it's a good example of that. <clears throat> if you watch a football team, a basketball team, or a baseball team that has a great winning percentage, playing really good, very few injuries. That's right. If you have a team that's getting crushed, getting beat, everybody gets hurt. Yep. It, it, it just happens. You just right. always notice that. Absolutely. And it definitely follows the emotional state. And so if you can create, if you can learn to create your own emotional state moment to moment. See, this society teaches us that our emotions and feelings are the subject of our environment. Mm -hmm. Well, if I don't feel good, it's because my wife isn't treating me right. That's got nothing to do with her. I get to choose how I feel. Mm -hmm. See, But everybody's become a victim. The government's not treating me right. My family doesn't treat me right. Yeah. You know, and so... At, in that state, you have no control, and you, you're just everything yeah. starts to fall apart. Or you watch the evening news and get all excited about what the latest idiot is doing, but what are you going to do from your living room about it? Right. But you got all these hormones running. You see, and believe it or not, that's what causes domestic violence in many cases. Two people who love each other, committed to each other, get in an argument. Not that it's ever happened to any of us, but in theory, <laughs> okay. But now this is somebody you care about. Now you're in a fight with them. And on top of the issue, you're concerned you're going to lose them because they're, they're threatening to get out, just leave, mm -hmm. right? You might be threatening to leave. Well, that means something's very precious to you is being taken away. And you start getting more and more excited, more and more fearful, more and more upset. And as soon as you trigger that adrenal threshold, your body can only do one thing, fight or flight. You either hit her, or you run away and don't come back. Mm -hmm. Does that solve anything? No. Mm -hmm. You see? But here's the part that gets into the addiction part and the compulsive behavior part. Once the body hits a stress threshold where it feels like it's being threatened, it's a survival trigger in the midbrain, yeah. there is no access to the thinking mind anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so what we do, along with the nutrition and the different therapies, is we teach people how to regulate that. But it's a two-step thing. First of all, you got to teach them how to stay away from that arousal point unless right. a bear's coming. Somebody's trying to assault your wife, just go for it, right? But if you're just thinking about somebody insulting her three weeks ago at a party and you're getting all upset, that ain't doing anybody any good, okay. see? All right? So it's learning how to lower the threshold when it's not appropriate. And then secondly, it's Navy SEAL training. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now you can take raw recruits in, in six to eight weeks, scream and holler at them and fire guns over their head, and get them to where hopefully they don't run away if they're in a battle situation. Now they aren't really accomplishing much. I mean, these guys are shooting, what, 40, 50,000 bullets to kill one person because they're terrified. But they follow orders, Right. Now, what about a Navy SEAL or a recon sniper? What, what's their emotional attitude in, in combat? They are good. They're excellent Just, in what they do. And, Ro and like how? almost robotic. Almost yeah. robotic, totally calm. Who do you want to go into battle with? Right. Yeah. See? But same thing in a relationship, same way in business, same way in sports. Do you want a guy that's, that's off the wall emotionally or somebody that stays calm in a crisis and is, is still functioning at a high level? 
You see? Who's going to perform the best? Golf is a great example because putting is a fine motor skill. And the guy who wins the majors is not necessarily the best golfer. It's the one who can stay the calmest, and the adrenaline doesn't override that fine motor control in his hands, and he mm. can still putt. Mm. Right? Yeah. Or you watch somebody like Tiger Woods or a few others that they get into the zone, and every yeah. shot's landing three to five feet from the, the pin. Are they thinking that? No. That's, that's an emotional zone that's beyond thinking. And you can learn <coughs> it. You can actually learn it. And when we do it in medicine, we now know that it's the key to spontaneous remission. We have cases in almost every form of, of injury and uh, uh, disease where someone somewhere got well without medical intervention. Now, that's written off in conventional medicine as an anomaly. My colleagues and I, we study it. What are the common denominators? And over the last 20 years, we now know what causes spontaneous remission. We know what you have to do to get one. <laughs> and, and, he, and you're saying it's the state of mind. That, that I'll give you a good example. I remember pulling a hamstring against um, the Celtics. And they said, um, you got two, three weeks before you can play again. I kept saying, no, I can play. Every night I went to bed and I said, you're going to be better when you wake up, Kermit. That's right. You're going to be better when you wake up. It's not going to be so tight. And in three days, I was back playing. Mm -hmm. Cause they were telling me two weeks. So it was bad. I mean, I right. couldn't walk the next day when I first heard it. But I just, I just kept saying, Kermit, you're going to get better. You're going to get better. Now, was it the words or the emotional attitude and confidence you brought to those words? I just wanted to get back. Well, I know, but it's uh, what cause what we now know makes the difference. You can say the words like an affirmation. No, I, I, long, I believed but it. But you believed it. It, it was in your it. heart. You felt it. The most dramatic example I personally know of, a colleague of mine, um, tw over 20 years ago, he was a young chiropractor in La Jolla, California. And uh, he was also an athlete, triathlete. He went to Palm Springs to perform in a triathlon. And on the bike part, he's coming around a corner. The policeman was there directing traffic, stopping the cars. An 80-year-old woman in a big black SUV ignored the policeman, hit him, threw him in the air, and ran over him. Oh, geez. Mm. Crushed eight vertebrae in his spine. Mm. Took, him to medevac took him to the hospital, obviously, trauma center. And they said, okay, all we can do with this is we do Im immediate surgery. We take out all the bones, chips, and we make a mush out of it and then cement iron rods into that to replace your, mm. your vertebrae. Mm. And he says, okay, uh, will I be able to walk? Probably not. Will I be out of pain? Probably not, but you'll be alive. He said, well, that sucks. <laughs> so he said, I want a second opinion. So he medevacs back to UCSD, uh, the Scripps Center there in, in San Diego. They told him the same thing. He said, nobody with that kind of back trauma has ever not had this surgery. Well, he said, can you guys do it so I, I can walk? No. Well, can you do it so I'm out of pain? No, but you'll be alive. Okay. He said, wait a minute. Just like Kermit, he said, I believe in my body. He was a chiropractor. They're trained to believe in the innate intelligence of the body. So he got a couple of his buddies to take care of him, put him in the reverse U for spinal cord injury, and he laid there for a couple of months. And he did just what Kermit did. Two and a half months later, he was back in his office adjusting patients. Three months later, he was in the weight room. No surgery, nothing. He did what you did and repaired eight crust vertebrae in his spine. Wow. I didn't have to do that. <laughs> but <laughs> but you that gotta, shows you, gotta, you what yes. you're capable of. Well, yeah. you know what? You know, I had back problems too, but you got it. I remember the doctor told me I had a on sciatic problem, very bad. My leg was, you know, smaller than the other one. He says, well, just rest. <clears throat> and he says, just lay down and rest. I said, well, if I lay down and rest, I'm going to get weak all over my That's body. Right. My skeleton structure is, is held together by the muscles. So if I don't work out or exercise, I'm going to have a whole lot of problems. Right. So what I did, I started walking up hills. I had my wife drop me at the bottom of the hill. And because when you walk up a hill, it's not stress on your back. It's your hamstrings. That's right. And I just did that every day, and my back got better and better and better. And in about like six months, I never had any back problems. But I had it for years before that. But, you know, listening to the doctor's, there's nothing wrong with that. No. But when they give you advice where you know it's not going to help you as an individual. Right. 
again, they're not trained in chronic health management or, or healing recovery. They're trained in crisis management, acute care crisis, and they're good at it. If you, I mean, if you're in the middle of the crisis, go get them to take care of you. But they're not trained in how to rehab it, not to, not to actually facilitate healing. So before we finish up, I wanted to introduce one more subject. Uh, I believe the, uh, Dr. Wilcox brought up a question about post-concussive TBI. Yeah. And um, it's in the news because of the football players. Right? We now have a concussion protocol. Yeah. I just attended a lecture by uh, the leading authority on post-concussive TBI, a Harvard, um, uh, Harvard Medical School physician, and I was shocked, really. So anyway, a couple of things I wanted to share with you from that. She says well, that's the same thing. We know about this now. We're talking about it because of the football players. And roughly four, maybe 500 football players a year, professionals, get post-concussive TBI and enter concussion protocol. And uh, she said, but what we're not talking about, besides all the kids playing football and other sports, especially soccer that are getting concussions, is the military. We have eighteen to 20,000 of our military going into concussion protocol every year. Okay? And nobody, got any tissue here? Nobody is doing anything about the 1.7 million abused women and children. Right. Having TBI, no, I'm, I'm just kidding, because <laughs> oh. I start crying when I start oh, I talking see. about this. <laughs> 1.7 million women and children post-concussive TBI every year in the United States, which means that we've got 35, 40 million of them floating around out there. And if a woman goes to a doctor and says, Doc, I've got headaches, um, kind of migrainey, flashing lights, um, I'm dizzy, I'm just tired all the time, what's the doctor first thing he thinks? Oh, it's women, woman problems. Yeah. Nobody thinks concussion. Just regular fatigue issues right. that people might run into. Now, that's bad enough because nobody's doing anything about this. Right. We hope to change that, okay? Because we actually have protocols that can reverse all that, okay? But before I tell you about that, they asked then the doctor from Harvard, what is the concussion protocol? Well, that's how we diagnose that you had a concussion, okay? No, doctor, how do you treat it? Hmm. Are you ready? Avoid bright lights, get a lot of rest, and don't get hit in the head again until you feel better. Mm. Now, if you're a professional athlete making a million bucks a year, you can probably afford to follow that advice. What about the women? Right. They got a family. They got a family. Can they stay in bed for a few weeks? Can they tell somebody, no. don't hit me for three weeks till I feel better? See, there is no protocol. The protocol is diagnostic and rest. Yeah. Okay? We have a system which is based on a lot of good medical evidence over a long time, but it's not being used in conventional medicine because they never ask the right question. They're asking, when are we going to get a drug that treats concussion? Yeah. When are we going to get a surgical procedure that treats concussion? All right? Now they'll get excited. But when you're dealing with what Dr. Wilcox and I do, when you're dealing with specific IV nutrition that gets into the brain and heals the tissue when you're dealing with neural reflex systems from, acu from uh, oriental medicine and from uh, chiropractic and physical therapy where we can literally reset the neural conditioning and then this emotional work like you use Kermit and like my buddy did, you add all that together, you can have somebody post-concussive operational again in mm. three to 10 days. Wow. Okay. And what's more, when you do that and do just a little follow-up care, they don't get the post-concussive syndrome like Junior Seau did, and 5, 10, 15 years down the road, it all comes back, and nobody knows what to do about it because now, just like these other things I've talked about, it's locked into the system, and the body thinks it's supposed to be there, mm -hmm. and it won't let you fix it. You see? But we can take that. that we, we have procedures that we can work with that, and they're based on all the things we talked about, the nutrition, the physical therapy, uh, the de detoxing if necessary, but most of all, working with how your nervous system and your brain integrates with your feelings. Because you're feeling, you, you, your body makes 20, 30 million new cells every second. It'll do that even if you're starving to death. It's still trying to make those cells, all right? You only control two things. The raw materials that it can make that new cell out of and the energetic spark your emotional attitude that tells your body how long do you want that cell to be around for and what do you want to do with it. Mm. 
If you're suicidally depressed, what kind of cells are you making? Not positive ones. No. Have you been laying in bed for six months? Right. Have you been in an unhappy relationship for, for years? What kind of cells are you making? But if we can teach you how to be happy moment to moment, no matter what your circumstances. I mean, we have studies from people in concentration camps during the wars. And they, they came out with not near the amount. We still have people in there. They're just now dying. They're, they're in, uh, one of my that I've told about, a guy named Ungleitner. He was uh, born in Austria. He was sickly. In fact, so sick that they had to move him out of the city. He was staying on a farm when in his teenage years. Told Doctors said, you'll never live to see 30. Okay. Well, about the time he turned 30, he got real religious, and uh, the Nazis took over Austria. He got thrown in a concentration camp as a conscientious objector. Right? Six years. First off, no doctor would ever believe he'd live that long. And when he came out, he was in bad shape. Weighed 60 pounds, beat up from head to toe, sores all over. So he ain't lasting very long, right? Yeah. Mr. Ungleitner just died a year or so ago at 107. Wow. That's amazing. And his last few years, they flew him all over the world to speak at the Holocaust Museums. And they'd say, well, tell us what happened in the camps. No, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how being kind to people makes them act better. And how if we're kind to people, we all happier. That's all, this whole focus. Hmm. So you know how he survived that long? that attitude you see and if we can all learn to, to function from that happier and healthier and we found that when you add that to the nutrition when you add that to the physical therapy now you can see miracles mm. that's very my interesting. that's my tail and i'm sticking to it <laughs> very interesting hey i tell you we we appreciate you coming yeah yeah definitely it was wonderful because i've learned a lot Thank you. But you know, the funny thing is, um, I think people need to learn the power of the mind, and the power of public, I mean, positive thinking, and really believing. When people say, I believe, now the question is, do they really believe? That's it. And see, that's where the, I like, to, instead of positive thinking, I'll say positive feeling. And if you use thinking, positive thinking to choose a feeling. Is you, are you using your thinking? So this is like a lot of people use affirmations. I feel healthy. I feel wonderful. I feel terrific. And what we found is they're very inefficient. Why? Because, again, you're lying to yourself. I get up in the morning and I don't feel good. Yeah, like Jesus said, repeating the same words, but they don't really mean anything. So if I don't feel well in the morning and I get up and look in the mirror, I feel healthy. I feel wonderful. I'm just lying to myself because my body knows I don't feel good. But now if I can use any of the techniques we've talked about and others that we use to actually create a little spark of a happy feeling, Picture holding a baby, petting a kitty, I don't care. Something that makes the body feel little. And then I say I feel good. Now I am affirming the truth. And it becomes 10,000 times more, posi- more possible. So when you talk positive thinking, you're right. It starts with a positive thought. But that positive thought has to be trigger and then uh, harmonious with a feeling that agrees with the thought. And that's where we stop. We tell people, you got to think the right thoughts, but if they don't follow through and create a feeling that fits that thought, it, it doesn't have a lot of effect on the body. It'll affect their head, but it doesn't affect the body. That's what, you know, that's what goes with um, hypnosis is also. Mm-hmm. Hypnosis is the same thing. It's, it's just making the b- person, the body, believe what you're thinking. And, um, like, I, I remember reading that book, psycho uh-huh. Elrod Hunt, who, who wrote that one? I don't remember. No, I don't remember the name either, but that, that's but a I, classic in the field. Yeah, I read it when I was, oh, it's 50 years ago because I was in college. I was having trouble with my free throw shooting. And what he said, you have to believe what you think and see a positive thing every single day. And I kept saying, right. you know what? I can see myself doing this successfully. Mm-hmm. I can see it and... What you just said was thing. He had three groups of people shooting free throws. Mm-hmm. The people shooting free throws, the people thinking about at their dorm shooting free throws, and the people that aren't doing anything. Okay, the people that weren't doing anything, they were still horrendous at free throw shooting. <laughs> but the people that were in their dorm visualizing shooting a successful free throw shooting had the same percentage as the people who were on the court shooting because right. they could visualize it. They yeah. could visualize the ball going through but there's a positive thought, too. It is, and it's also a positive feeling. Because remember, seeing is a physical function. Mm-hmm. 
And so there's actually four languages we use to talk to the body. The first is feelings and emotions. The second is your body symptoms and, and um, uh, sensations. If you have a headache, the body's trying to tell you something. Mm-hmm. The third is actually how you react to the senses. And one of those, that's the visualization pathway, because we have immediate visceral responses to what we see. Look at different kinds of artwork, for example, and we react differently. Uh, same way with smells. We're going to react differently if we step in dog poo on the, high, mm-hmm. on the sidewalk as if we look, bent over and smelled a rose. Okay? Right. So the senses directly trigger body feelings. And the fourth one is the one that we used as children. And it's still the most powerful, but we don't use it as much, not consciously. And that's modeling. Most of what you learned as a child, you learn by just imitating your parents. Yeah. And we've all probably heard in one form of lecture or another that your life, your feelings, your finances, and success are going to tend to be the average of your five closest associates. And it's true. We tend to be like the people we hang out with. But, we're, but that's not just nowadays, that's not just the people here in the room, it's the people we hang out with on TV and social media. Yeah. And because the body, in particular, um, visual auditory media is very, is very um, concerning because that's like your body looking at visuals in your head or in your heart, and it can't tell the difference. That's why movies work. You watch a movie, you have an emotional reaction, right? Yeah. Okay? Chick flick, you cry. Action flick, you get all excited. Well, don't you know it's a movie? Mentally, you do. But does your body know it's a movie? No. No. That's the difference we discovered in the last 20 years. you got to access that part that doesn't know that it isn't real. Ron, before we close, could you tell the listeners how to get a hold of you? Oh, that's a good idea. Call Kermit. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I can tell you. We'll have a, um, actually uh, getting a website set up, getbackyourbrain.com, and it'll have information. What is that again now? Getbackyourbrain.com. Okay, that's easy to remember. Easy to remember. Getbackyourbrain.com, so you'll be able to go there. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Um, but you can always message me there. And, okay. uh, and uh, Dr. Wilcox and I are always willing to talk to somebody and help them. But we're having an, uh, an initial program where we'd like to get a, a group of people that are willing to give us before and after feedback on the, the results so that we can get more people involved in the program. And Ron, for the listening audience, can you spell your last name? J-A-H-N-E-R. Ronald J-A-H-N-E-R. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. It's very interesting and hope to have you on, um, gosh, you know, regularly, if you don't mind. I'd be happy to. Okay, that's yep. reinforce we'll, 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 everything that we've learned. We thank you very out. much. I appreciate it. i